Hello, and welcome to the Walrus Talks at Home Housing, presented by the Canada Mortgage and Housing Corporation. I'm Jennifer Hollett, the Executive Director of the Walrus, and we're really excited to be joining you virtually, bringing together people across the country and now beyond because we're doing this online. I'd like to start by acknowledging the land that I'm on in Toronto, Tech Toronto. I come to you from the territory of the Huron Wendat, the Pichon First Nations, the Seneca, and the Mississaugas of the New Credit. Toronto has long been a meeting place of Indigenous peoples, and we're honored to carry on a tradition of conversation. I'd like to invite you right now to join me to take a moment to pause and reflect on the land that you're on and the moment in history that we're in. Thank you so much. I'm going to tell you a little bit about the walrus. Uh, we started 17 years ago as an ambitious new project to tell the stories of Canada and to foster conversation. And we do this in a bunch of different ways. We do it through our print publication, but also online at thewalrus.ca, through our podcast, The Conversation Piece, and through our public event series, The Walrus Talks, which is now The Walrus Talks at Home. And our work at The Walrus is powered by community, our donors, supporters, and partners. So thank you so much to CMHC for making this event possible to everyone who is here to be a part of the conversation. To start things off, please welcome CMHC's Senior Vice President of Policy and Innovation, Michel Tremblay. Good evening. It's a pleasure for me to join you from Ottawa under traditional unceded territory of the Algonquin and Anishinaabeg people. Like me, you're probably taking part in this event from the comfort of your home. In fact, these days you're probably doing most everything from home. The COVID-19 pandemic has made our homes more important than ever. At the same time, it has highlighted Canada's serious housing issues. Some 1.6 million Canadian households are living in housing that is unaffordable, overcrowded, or unsafe. These include some of the most vulnerable people in our society the very same people that are hit hardest by COVID-19. Housing matters more than ever. It will help keep Canadians healthy through the second wave of the pandemic, and it is the foundation for our country's recovery. At CMHC, we have mobilized all of our resources behind one audacious goal, to ensure that by 2030, everyone in Canada has a home that they can afford and that meets their needs. Canada's national housing strategy is giving us great momentum towards reaching this goal. The strategy is a 10-year, more than $55 billion plan to help Canadians have a place to call home. But governments alone can't fix our country's housing issues. Housing matters to everyone. We need all sectors to get on board and work to find innovative solutions. That's why we are pleased to sponsor tonight's event. We know that affordable housing is at the cornerstone of a resilient, sustainable, and inclusive communities. We also know that it's key to an economy where we can all prosper and thrive. So what are the perceptions and barriers that are getting in our way? Who can help us overcome them? How can we all work together better to achieve common goals? The Walrus has lined up excellent speakers for tonight's event. It's going to be an energetic and thought-provoking conversation. I want to thank you for being part of it. Please keep this important conversation going. Enjoy the event and stay safe. Thank you so much, Michelle. Canada's housing conversation is vital to the way we live. And this evening, we'll hear from four leaders on how organizations and society at large can support affordable housing and why we're all accountable for making sure that everyone has a place to live. Here's how it works. Each speaker has five minutes. And once we've heard all of the ideas, we're gonna open it up to a Q&A with the speakers and you at home. Tonight, we'll be hearing from CEO of Van City Community Investment Bank, Jan Gilboy, CEO of Vancouver Native Housing Society, David Eddy, Executive Director of Population Health and Social Medicine at the University Health Network, Andrew Buzeri, and Ryder, Christina D'Amico. And our moderator for tonight is freelance reporter, Emily Mathieu. Also a shout out to our audience. We have members registered from all over Calgary, Vancouver, Ottawa, Halifax, and beyond. Thank you all for joining us. 
Hi, I'm Jayanne Guilfoy, CEO of Van City Community Investment Bank. I'd like to start off by acknowledging that I'm calling in from the traditional unceded territory of the Coast Salish people, represented by the Katsi, the Kwantlen, the Kekwitlam, and Kikite, and the Semiami First Nations. They have been custodians of this land for thousands of years, and I would like to pay my respects to the elders, both past and present. Canada's housing and affordability crisis is one of the most critical challenges facing our communities today. According to a newly published Toronto Foundation report, in Toronto, nearly half of all renters spend more than 30% of their income on housing. That's the point at which housing is considered unaffordable. At the height of the pandemic in April and May this year, up to 13% of renters were unable to pay their rent in full. It's not just Toronto either. This problem is national in scope. A report released just last year by the Canadian Centre for Policy Alternatives reveal that if you're a worker making minimum wage, there are no neighborhoods in Canada's biggest cities where you can affordable, affordably rent a one or two bedroom apartment. And the pandemic is only worse, worsening this crisis with people shifting to remote work and considering more distant communities outside of major cities. The affordable, affordability crisis is moving out more broadly. Just last month, the housing market saw double digit price increases in cities across the country. The current housing situation in Canada creates inequities and exacerbates the difficulties for everyone to be an equal member of our society and participate fully in our economy. But it doesn't need to be this way. In fact, today I want to talk to you about why investment in affordable housing is not just the right thing to do, but a sound business decision. If the pandemic has taught us anything, it's that strong, resilient communities are key to protecting our national economy. And a national economy that's strong is good for everyone. Today, both low and middle income families struggle to enter the housing market. And in the context of the pandemic and escalating unemployment, an increasing number of people are facing housing instability as they struggle to make rent or mortgage repayments. We also know that these challenges disproportionately affect minorities and vulnerable populations and have far ranging impacts on outcomes like health, education, community cohesion, job stability and economic resilience. Through affordable housing, we can empower individuals and families to afford the basic necessities, cover their housing costs, increase disposable income, and save for an emergency. And that's why Event City Community Investment Bank has chosen to invest in social purpose real estate projects, working with nonprofits, housing cooperatives, community foundations, and private developers to create immediate and long lasting change in the communities in which we operate. And it comes from our roots back in Van City, where the Greater Vancouver Region has benefited from a community-focused credit union advocating for policy changes, providing granting and funding to help with the crisis on the West Coast. So over the last two years, VCIB has financed more than 30 social real estate property projects that directly benefit the community, resulting in over 1,300 units of new or preserved affordable housing. By financing affordable condos, we're helping middle-income families enter the housing market and build equity. By financing shelters, supportive housing, and the preservation of affordable rental housing, we're helping low-income and vulnerable populations find a stable foothold. All the while, we're future-proofing our economies and helping those to withstand future economic upheaval upheavals, like the one we are experiencing right now during the COVID-19 pandemic. At VCIB, we believe that values-based banking can be a powerful tool to creating a more sustainable and equitable housing model. And we have the results to show for it. Earlier this month, in partnership with the Parkdale Neighborhood Land Trust, VCIB launched a tailored impact investment program to address Parkdale's housing crisis. Over the past decade, Parkdale has lost 28 rooming houses in the neighborhood to gentrification, displacing nearly 350 tenants, many of whom are now facing homelessness and disproportionately impacting the BIPOC people and working class residents. Working closely with the Parkdale Neighborhood Trust, we designed a new financing solution called the Preserve and Protect Program, allowing the nonprofit to rapidly acquire at-risk affordable rental buildings in Parkdale. So far, over $4 million has already been secured in investment from notable foundations and nonprofits. The Parkdale Neighborhood Land Trust is now monitoring 59 at-risk rental properties in the area with the objective of protecting over 40 units of affordable rental housing in the first round of the program. And we're very proud to be part of this. 
Our work with Parkdale Neighborhood Land Trust is, is an example of how financial institutions can use the tool of finance to create positive change. Projects like this, traditionally overlooked by the finance industry for their complexity and smaller size, not only create meaningful social and economic changes in communities, but are also a profitable long-term investment. As a proud B Corp and a member of the Global Alliance for Banking on Values, we strongly believe that the financial industry should be a key driver in facilitating our economic recovery. We also believe that this economic recovery must be green and it must be inclusive. By providing the needs of the people and planet, we all create a more profitable, more resilient and more sustainable business landscape. We need to move past the outdated beliefs that values and purpose work at odds with good business. Time and time again, this has proven otherwise. I'd like to finish off by looking to the future. The affordability crisis right now seems insurmountable, but the writing isn't on the wall. We have the power to make real change. But to do this, we need to begin looking at different ways to do business. We need to start thinking creatively and looking at new ways to address these challenges. Last week, BCIB announced that it has signed a groundbreaking agreement with the Canadian Mortgage and Housing Corporation, which, which will see BCIB commit up to $100 million in financing affordable housing solutions across Canada. Projects will be financed by VCIB and will benefit from CMHC's organizational support, expertise, and network of programs. This agreement marks the very first time that CMHC has joined forces with a financial institution and, saw, and signals a real shift in collaboration between the public and private sector. I hope that our work inspires more innovative collaboration and commitments towards solving Canada's housing crisis. Together, we can build stronger, more resilient communities. Thank you. Hi, my name is David Eddy, and I'm the CEO of Vancouver Native Housing Society. Before I begin my presentation, I want to acknowledge that I'm speaking from the traditional and unceded territory of the Squamish, Musqueam, and tsleil peoples. I also want to thank the folks at CMHC and the staff at the Walrus for allowing me to speak on an issue that is near and dear to me and my colleagues in the urban Indigenous housing sector. VNHS was created to serve Vancouver's urban Indigenous community in 1984. Back in the day, we began as an organization with a focus on family housing. We have since morphed out to offer housing across the continuum, including that for seniors, singles, youth, and women fleeing abuse. We currently have a total of 850 housing units in 20 buildings. We have three other projects in various stages of development which in three years will add another 400 units and four more buildings to our portfolio. The early 1970s to the early 1990s were in many people's opinion, the heyday of social housing in Canada. In fact, I think it's fair to say that the programs created mostly by CMHC were the envy of the Western world in terms of innovation and delivery. The Canadian cooperative housing movement got its start then as well. One of the most innovative programs during that time was the Urban Native Housing Program initiated in 1978, as it recognized the unique needs of the large population of Indigenous folks who had left the reserves and moved to the country's urban centers. In 1993, the federal government of the day, for reasons they put down to deficit reduction, decided to end their involvement in creating any new social and affordable housing programs. This has been the situation until very recently when the most recent federal government began working on a national housing strategy for the mainstream population and a separate indigenous housing strategy. In essence, the feds are getting back in the game, which of course in our minds is nothing but good news. However, there is one area in the proposed indigenous housing strategy that causes those of us in urban, rural and northern indigenous housing sector grave concern. The federal government has expressed that their indigenous housing strategy have three distinctions, which are First Nations, Inuit and Métis. We understand and agree that these separate groups have housing requirements that are grave, obvious and need to be considered. Our problem is that it leaves a separate distinction or group which is by far the largest number of Indigenous people in the country out in the cold, so to speak. We know from recent StatsCan information that only 13% of Indigenous folks live on reserve. Many in the other two distinctions or groups, Inuit and Métis, 
also live in urban settings. I work with the Canadian Housing and Renewal Association and sit on their Indigenous Caucus Working Group. It's composed of just over 100 member groups. The organization I work for, Vancouver Native Housing Society, is a member of the Aboriginal Housing Management Association, which is the first Canadian nonprofit Indigenous housing authority in Canada. AMA is an umbrella organization composed of 41 members that are each Indigenous housing providers. Their members represent over 5,000 Indigenous families living in the urban, rural, and northern regions of British Columbia. Both of these organizations support the concept that we call FIBI, for Indigenous, by Indigenous, whereby we support the concept of a fourth distinction, which we call the urban, rural, and northern housing. And we estimate includes at least 75% of all Indigenous peoples living in Canada. Urban Indigenous housing providers have over 40 years experience and indeed expertise in providing safe, affordable and appropriate housing for the urban Indigenous community. We have combined budgets in excess of $40 billion. We are the only ones providing this service for our client group. We know the record shows our efforts have resulted in effective, efficient and professional service, as well as compassionate and supportive care to our tenants. We are the only ones that have been doing this and believe we've been doing so in an effective, efficient and professional manner. We've been lobbying the federal government for the last two years to make what we consider to be necessary and obvious changes to include the, our fourth distinction. For the first year and a half, these efforts have fallen on deaf ears. We're just now starting to see them gaining traction. Our message to our friends in the federal government is, your predecessors did good when they created the urban ho native housing program back in the 70s. It still works extremely well. It's not broken, so please don't try to fix it. Please include the fourth distinction of urban, rural, and northern housing in the new Indigenous housing strategy. Thank you. Hi, and thank you so much to the Walrus uh, for inviting me uh, this evening for the talk on housing and a crisis that we've really had um, in our city, in our country, uh, well before the pandemic, um, but has been compounded and imposing um, suffering and hurt on so many and thousands across uh, the country right now. Uh, my name is Andrew Buzari. I'm a primary care physician uh, with the Inner City Health Associates, uh, as well as an executive director uh, for social medicine and population health at the University Health Network. And uh, really just hoping, uh, really looking forward to the discussion uh, with so many experts in the room on this issue uh, and the learning to take place, uh, but hoping to have a few reflections as someone, uh, as a person who has benefited uh, from social housing, whose family has uh, over our time in Canada, uh, as well as uh, a primary care clinician uh, of not to speak for patients and communities, um, but I think where we've seen um, so much uh, resilience and strength that I feel has been lost along the way and in the conversations, both uh, pre-pandemic and currently, um, and, and really from a policy perspective about how for us to truly have a universal healthcare system, uh, we really do need uh, to see uh, housing first and housing and health uh, connected in ways that I, I don't believe we, we've made that fulsome connection uh, in the way that we need to. Um, you know, really I think from the learnings that we've had through the pandemic um, and the ways that uh, so much of the inequities have uh, been pulled back, have been magnified. Um, really, the curtain has been pulled back on inequities that for far too long we've really accepted as a country. Uh, and I think one of the, the hope uh, that I have and I know many share is that we can actually build something better, uh, but with people and with communities that best understand um, how the lack of housing, uh, how homelessness has really upended um, people's lives uh, and the sort of supports and um, design that needs to take place 
um, for people to have the meaningful lives and choices that only they can make. Um, and I think one of the, the pieces that we can't shirk any longer is just how racialized uh, poverty and homelessness are in our country. Um, we've seen this in terms of, of black, brown and indigenous uh, communities through COVID. The latest data showing over 80% of COVID cases disproportionately harming um, communities of color. Um, over 50% of the cases in Toronto affecting low income households. And so much of this we're not even seeing in terms of the data is not capturing um, of the suffering that the pandemic has brought for people who have been underhoused and who are also grappling and struggling with the other pathologies of poverty uh, that again, we have long seen take hold in our country. Uh, and I really do also have to give so much credit to the community response through the pandemic. I think this is where the innovation has been uh, to really rise up to the challenge early around the idea that when the public health messaging was uh, stay at home, if you can, uh, for too many, for thousands, they couldn't. And uh, we were fortunate as UHN to be able to partner with uh, Parkdale Queen West Community Health Center, Inner City Health Associates, Toronto Public Health, the Neighborhood Group, and Inner City Family Health Team in trying to pull together hotel recovery sites for people experiencing homelessness as places to um, recover from COVID, but also get access to harm reduction supports and social and community supports that again have been far too long denied uh, to people. And I think we can see just how much we need to have the audacity to get COVID to zero. Uh, we've had complacency with COVID and have initially set thresholds that were only inhumane for certain communities to experience uh, going into this winter. But I also believe we need that same audacity to get homelessness to zero in our country. Uh, and it's a, it, it's, it's a challenge and it's a mission that many in the room, that many in so many other spaces have been advocating for for decades. And I believe that we've seen more and more evidence about just how tightly connected housing and health are. People who are experiencing homelessness before the pandemic uh, would you know, not be expected to make it past their 55th birthday. Uh, we also know about how disproportionately concentrated disease and the burden of disease are uh, for people who uh, of mental health and physical health of people living um, on the streets or sleeping rough uh, and people experiencing homelessness. And really uh, the task is on us, I believe, coming out of the pandemic uh, and coming through the pandemic to protect people through the winter. We have now currently have over a thousand people sleeping outside in encampments. And I know that it makes people uh, uncomfortable seeing that, but it should only speak to our failure on housing. And if it creates such discomfort, then we need to see the housing take place. And I think it needs to be a call to action that people who have felt neglected and shut out of uh, our shelter system, of our housing system, have had to respond with their own creativeness, with their own ingenuity uh, to save their own lives. And I believe we really need to come together now like never before uh, to address the housing crisis, uh, COVID crisis, the overdose crisis, with the sort of complexity that has um, that we have we have not been willing uh, to bring that collective effort for that will require all policymakers, all levels of government, and public and private sector to really come together and acknowledge that these that we have long allowed life years to be siphoned away from people, and we need this response now. Um, if we're ever gonna be able to, to talk about our country as one that puts health first. Hi, my name is Christina D'Amico and I work at the Center for Teaching Support and Innovation at the University of Toronto. And that's also where I completed my PhD in the Department of English. And I'm also a recent writer for The Walrus. I just wanna thank the folks at The Walrus for you know inviting me to participate in this talk tonight. As someone who predominantly works in the humanities, I'm often invited to talk about, you know, books, arts, and culture. Uh, but it's really nice to see an organization taking an interdisciplinary approach to, you know, such an important topic like housing. So I'm really happy to be here tonight. 
Um, I think what I'm going to do is uh, talk a little bit about the article that I actually wrote for the Walrus and then respond more broadly to our theme tonight, this idea of housing for all. So first then on to the article. So the piece that I wrote for the Walrus magazine is looking at the rise of the tiny house movement in uh, Canada and the United States. And for folks who don't know, the tiny house movement is, I mean, it's exactly what it sounds like. It's a group of folks who uh, want to live simply, sustainably and affordably in extremely small dwellings. I mean, I'm talking like 400 square feet uh, in homes that they have built themselves. And if you were to say, Google it, just to kind of get a, a shot in your mind of what they look like, I would bet you that the first like 100 to 200 images that you're gonna see are gonna be of tiny homes pictured in nature, um, away from the urban uh, and away from other people. Um, so, one of the things, um, if you're wondering about, um, you know, why tiny homes, what is it about that's compelling about this topic, I'm going to talk a little bit more about my research uh, later on. But in the article, something I really think about is uh, a tension that I saw emerging within this movement. On the one hand, the tiny living movement, I mean, it is a social movement. So it's very much invested in scaling itself up and you know, essentially changing the way it is that we live both in Canada and North America. But on the other hand, there's also a profoundly um, individualist strain in the movement that suggests it's a pretty idiosyncratic way to live and it's not actually meant for the masses. It's actually something that's maybe only suitable for a particular group of people. So this is a tension I try to tease out a little bit in the article that I wrote. Now, if you're wondering why someone in the humanities is thinking about tiny houses and housing in general, it's partly because in my research, I think a lot about the uh, idea of property, specifically the idea of property owning personhood, which is essentially another way of saying that there is an intimate connection between, you know, what it means to be human and the ability to own things in the world. There's a long liberal history of connecting ownership to uh, an idea of the human. And that's something I explored quite a bit in my research through different authors um, and philosophers who are thinking about this topic. And one author that I thought about extensively was Henry David Thoreau. Uh, it's probably a 19th century American author um, who is probably most famous for his book Walden and uh, maybe even more famous for all of the fanfare that goes along with Walden because in the book he uh, details his, his uh, you know, leaving home, moving into the woods, building his own house and living there alone for two years. Um, I first read Walden actually it was in 2011. So it was about three years into the subprime mortgage crisis. And uh, at the time, if you remember, there was just an absolute glut of cultural production around houses, housing crises, banking, banking crisis. I mean, that, that could be an article in and of itself. It could be a book in and of itself. Um, but I was reading Walden at the same time as I was, as all of this was transpiring and the tiny house movement was also really taking off. So all of these pieces were sort of coming together um, in my mind at the time. And, you know, interestingly for Thoreau, I think folks in general really do deify Thoreau um, as being this figure of, you know, a great sage of wisdom. But at the time he moved to Walden Pond, you know, he was just a guy in his late 20s um, who was very disaffected and unhappy with his life, couldn't get a job, um, you know, didn't want a conventional uh, domestic life, didn't want to get married and ultimately decided to pursue a, a radical and very different pathway to find you know, meaning in his life. Um, and if anyone has read Walden, you'll know that the sentiment of the book is very much, how do you achieve a level of self-actualization and happiness in a world or in a society that seems designed to kind of hamper your autonomy and your freedom? It felt to me very much like an extremely millennial sentiment, you know, all the way back from 1845. Um, uh, but also in, in thinking about that for Thoreau, that idea of living small and uh, is really attached to an idea of living freely and gaining a measure of freedom through ownership. And that's a sentiment that really does um, ring true with the folks in the tiny house movement as well. Um, now, you know, there's nothing particularly 
wrong per se with this approach or way of living, but I think much like our, the conventional ways that we think about housing, it does actually leave a lot of people behind. So if you're not resource rich or time rich like Thoreau and that you can go and you know build yourself your own tiny home, this mode of living might not actually be suitable for you. And when thinking about our theme tonight, that idea of housing for all, if you know we're going to be invested um, in you know pursuing policy changes around housing, I think most of us would want to do something that would resonate uh, and be impactful for you know the greatest number of people. Um, and finally, on that topic of housing for all tonight, um, when I think of that as a, a kind of pressing challenge that you know we're facing in our current context, I think of I think two broad uh, pillars that we would have to address. Uh, and the, the first thing would be addressing some of those systemic issues uh, that lead to ongoing housing insecurity. Um, the largest one being, you know, wages and cost of living. And then the second uh, point being how we as Canadians are going to, you know, recommit ourselves to our treaty responsibilities to Indigenous peoples in Canada. Because you know, I don't think you can have a conversation uh, about housing or just housing uh, without you know also having a conversation about land and land ownership. So I think that's all I'll say for now. Um, I hope you get a chance to read the article if you too are fascinated by tiny homes. And I'm looking forward to our conversation tonight and to hearing your questions. Thanks, Jennifer, and thanks again to JN, David, Andrew, and Christina. I'm so pleased to have been asked to moderate tonight's discussion. It's incredibly timely and an important topic, and we're just going to wait for our speakers to join us and start the Q&A. If you have questions, you can submit them during the chat, and looking forward to what's going to be a great conversation. Got everyone on screen. Um, David, I wanted to start with you. You talked a bit about the fourth distinction or the lack of the fourth distinction, and I wanted to know from your view, why such a significant gap exists in the national strategy when it comes to Indigenous housing? You know, that's a question a lot of us in the, the sector have. And uh, I, I think it's probably due to, to CMHC's um, traditional uh, dealings with on-reserve uh, folks more than anything else, although notwithstanding CMHC brought out the Urban Indigenous Program. So it's a bit of a dichotomy in my mind as to why they were so, um, uh, so there in 1978 that they realized there, there was a tremendous need for this program. And it, it's really one of the um, best programs, if I can use that word, in in social housing. There's many, many programs in, in Indigenous and mainstream social housing, but the urban native is, is highly regarded for the insight that the folks who created it had. So it's a bit of a mystery. Uh, maybe all those people have retired by now, um, but uh, don't know why. You sounded a bit optimistic when you said, you know, the federal government is coming back into housing. And I mean, do you feel like, you know, you're pushing for this distinction? Do you feel like you're getting traction on that issue? Well, as I said, uh, just in the last really half of this year, mm -hmm. uh, people are listening. We're pushing very hard. And, um, you know, we, we have some champions out there. Uh, and I think uh, Evan Siddell is probably one of them. Um, uh, Mr. Vaughn, MP Vaughn in Ontario, um, they are they are lobbying for us. So we've noticed as of late that there's um, a more uh, more traction, and we got great uh, uh, advocates like uh, Margaret Foe and um, and Justin Marchand in Ontario. Margaret Foe was uh, CEO of AMA here in BC, uh, and uh, of course. Um, in uh, uh, Mr. Byers in uh, Regina, mm -hmm. who's the chair of our, our working ca caucus, Robert Byers. So those voices are starting to get traction. Yeah, I am. I am glad to hear that. Now I'm going to bring it down from you know this giant overview down to microhousing and take it over to Christina. Uh, you know, you talked a little bit about sort of microhousing in theory. But I wanted to explore a bit some of the practical um, examples that you're seeing of microhousing for people who might not be familiar, and this would be sanctioned or unsanctioned. Um, please go ahead. 
Yeah, I mean, um, for anyone who's tuning in from Toronto, I think the example I'm going to give is probably going to ring true. So in the last week, uh, there's a Toronto-based carpenter, Khalil Sevright, who's been building uh, shelters for free for homeless folks in the city. And in the past week, uh, the city has been threatening to, you know, remove the shelters, uh, remove them at cost to Khalil, who's the person who's been putting this up. And alongside with this as well, we've also seen a bit of an attack on a lot of community-based efforts, community fridges in Parkdale um, as well. And all of these um, sort of the legal issue around this is municipal bylaws around land use. That's essentially the city's line on why these things can't happen. Uh, so in a practical sense, I do think if anyone was pursuing a kind of small, modular, tiny type of housing, that would probably be one thing that they would have to um, have to strongly address. And in the article, I talk a little bit about a better tent city in Kitchener, Waterloo. And I, I spoke with one of the architects of that project and municipal bylaws was um, probably the most practical thing that kept coming up over and over again as a barrier. I'm actually excited to come back to bylaws, uh, believe it or not, and I am gonna come back to that. Um, I wanted to ask JM, just talking a little bit, I mean, you've mentioned, you know, we know about the great project, the collaboration that happened in Parkdale. And now, you know, we've got the CMHC is, is buying in. I wanted to ask a little bit about the private sector and, and what you're seeing in terms of sort of big money donors or banks when it comes to these new financial models for housing. Yeah, I think I think there are a couple of, of uh, investment vehicles out there, but not a lot, right? So I think that's one of the opportunities that, that we have as we come out of COVID particularly is to, is to have our governments play a role in sort of backstopping investment, but allowing more private investment to come into this part of, uh, of rebuilding our economy, of dealing with, with affordable housing issues. Because I, I think it's been, you know, unless the land is owned by a government entity, it's very difficult for the private sector, or private developers to, you know, make the math work. So there's got to be ways that we can have government play a slightly different role so that we could be better positioned. You know, Excellent. certainly, certainly credit unions and, and you know, values based banks like us um, are in the space, but I, I think there needs to be a lot more money coming into it and a lot more interest in making it happen at a faster pace. The land piece is really interesting because I always sort of imagine big money investors wouldn't have a problem acquiring land, but in urban environments, much yeah. of it is owned by the city and the province. That's and right. That's right. just quickly before I go into Andrew, I mean, the model that you're using, how easy would it be to scale it up? Well, the, the model that we put into Parkdale was mm -hmm. exactly a model that we want to be able to scale. So we think the idea of, of a, of a not-for-profit owning, owning land, buying land, keeping land in community, making sure land stays within the community with the intention of having uh, places for people to live forever, we think is a brilliant model. And so we think there's opportunities to scale that. Uh, we've worked with a number of other types of developers who have other models like Habitat for Humanity and others. So we think there's a number of different models that are working really well. We just have to figure out how to scale it. Thank you. Um... Andrew, I'm coming down to you um, for the last, well, I guess of round one. And before we get into the systemic discrimination piece, which I think is an incredibly important topic, I think I was just hoping you could sort of root us in what it's actually been like for healthcare workers who are seeing the results of systemic discrimination and poverty um, and the rise in cases of COVID. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think, um... Uh, it's, it's just really important to be grounded, I think, with the humility that, uh, you know, yes, healthcare workers, you know, my friends, colleagues, myself um, are, are tired. But when, I think the last part of your question, you know, caught me as well about the systemic discrimination. I think we've seen it really uh, play out in long term care homes for uh, women working as uh, mainly as, as personal support workers. Uh, and how racialized and how much uh, vulner um, structural vulnerability and discrimination has taken place for people who've been working in long-term care homes. Uh, so I really, you know, I think for, you know, where I'm situated on University Avenue right now, I think, you know, looking across uh, at the hospital and, and colleagues who are working in the emergency department and the floors, uh, just huge amount of gratitude. And I think that there's a sense of, you um, fatigue, but not in the way that it's about the, the work, but I think the disconnect um, from what we're seeing take place uh, coming into hospitals, but also out in communities uh, and the action that's not happening 
uh, to help where we know what's driving a lot of these rates, a lot of the COVID rates, but a lot of the hurt and the suffering. And I would also be remiss not uh, to give um, all of our love and solidarity to shelter staff and essential service workers. You know, I think healthcare workers have done a huge amount of lifting uh, and will continue to and have, uh, but there's also been so much that's happened where we've seen uh, people before that we labeled as minimum wage or unskilled labor who have really helped propel uh, us through the pandemic, have continued to and had risked their lives and continue to without the sort of PPE and protective equipment and supports um, that some of us in hospital get, but in even some of us in other settings um, where it's not as readily available. So I just think that that's a piece where we're all feeling that heaviness. And I think we have to, to break down some of those divisions between the hierarchies we've seen in the healthcare space. I'm going to come back to you with the piece about hierarchies, but we've got a, an audience question and you effectively answered most of it, but just talking about the connection between, you know, housing and other social determinants of health or how vitally important it is that someone has housing. Or what does it do to their health if they don't? I, it's sometimes hard where we are in the pandemic, and I have full respect for the question and the questions that have been there about housing and health. Um, but it is so fundamental. I mean, we, you cannot have health in, the, in this country and society without housing. And the fact that we've allowed this to go on for so long pre-pandemic only speaks to the roots and the reach of systemic discrimination that we have been okay as a society or country that some people will have access to housing and too many will not. And I think, again, I would really push on us not to think as people as infectious vectors as to why we're now thinking about rapid housing initiatives and wanting to say that, okay, to keep everyone safe, we should be able to have people isolate and have housing. But once the pandemic's done, we can go back to accepting the rates of homelessness we have. I think it's been great to see some doctors push for COVID zero to get to that, I think it's great, but I think we should have that same audacity to get homelessness to zero, both now, but through the pandemic, if we actually are serious about seeing health equity in this country. Yeah, absolutely. Someone has um, sent a question for Christina, and this is a little more architectural. Um, honestly, just you know, saying, you know, it's a great idea about building, um, you know, small shelters or environments, but in a climate like ours, mm -hmm. aren't you know shared walls more? economically and environmentally sound when it comes to heating and cooling. And I respect the question, but I think, I do wanna go back to the idea. I think we were touching more on the idea of, you know, building emergency housing for people. Um, but I'll let you answer that. Yeah, I, I fully agree with whoever asked the question. I'm personally not in favor of tiny living or modular living as a, a large scale social solution to housing. Uh, and I similarly, I appreciate any effort that is looking to ameliorate people's quality of life, like Khalil's effort in building these shelters. Uh, and I wish the city would respond positively because I think the short term impact would be outstanding. Um, but yeah, all most research shows that high density urban living is the most sustainable from an environmental environmental standpoint. Um, and similarly, like in the, just thinking in the conversation about what would even make a tiny or modular living sustainable or workable, I think you would need a subsequent um, investment in you know, public service and public infrastructure. Because if you're gonna live in a 200 square foot space, you know, you're gonna need access to transit to get you around, um, public parks to spend time in, libraries, childcare, um, I think a housing strategy that's paired with a strong public infrastructure investment would make would make the most sense and, and be the most sustainable. Jan, can I go back to you for a second? I mean, I, I know about the project in Parkdale and I've, I've talked about to them about the rooming houses. What are some of the other examples of sizes of housing that you're investing in? So we, uh, we've invested in uh, very large uh, condo uh, complexes where there's an affordability component to it. So options for home would be an example of that or Trillium that are building multifamily units that you know there's a, uh, a measurement of how, how you can afford to do this and then they, put, they kick in. So there's a second mortgage for home ownership. Um, we've, we've invested in um, facilities that are, that are uh, set up for people with some sort of ability issue. So we've kind of, I think all of them would be multifamily and they would be different sizes depending on, on the developer and the project and the not-for-profit that's leading it. I think we, we had a question from an audience member just asking you to weigh in on the, on the um, well, on inclusionary zoning. 
Um, but I mean, I, I think it's my understanding and correct me if I'm wrong. I mean, you're dealing with an entirely different structure. You're not just yeah. dealing with that. So for those who don't know, inclusionary zoning is effectively um, a developer agrees to have a certain percentage of units be deemed yeah. affordable by the CMHC rules. And it sounds like the, the projects that you're doing are, are free from those constraints. So you're building strictly affordable housing, not a percentage within. We're financing affordable housing. We definitely think there's a role to play in helping those private developers do that right. Okay. The idea that you have, uh, you have in, within each project permanent affordable housing, because I think one of the challenges with that, with the way we do it now is that it's, it's affordable for a time and it's not permanent. So I think there's a way to kind of work with developers, work with municipal governments, work with others to figure out, I, because I do agree with Christina that the best uh, solution is a solution that is multi-tenanted, multi-factored, community-based that has all different types of people living in it. So I'd like to see models that have permanent housing as part of the developer's requirement. Just Andrew, I wanted to take it back to you um, before it dropped off. I mean, we were talking again about, you know, discrimination and particularly in Toronto, you know, we've been seeing public health numbers get released that, that show that people in, um, you know, diverse communities are more deeply affected by COVID. And with the winter months actually upon us, I'm wondering if in terms of we could just think of concrete solutions, what would you suggest or what do you think government could do to remedy that inequality quickly um, so we don't you know, have them disproportionately affected during the second wave. Yeah, and I think just one of the things to, to add, I mean, as much as I was saying as well about um, people working in shelters, harm reduction workers, um, you know, our community health workers that have been so vital in the response, um, it's it's really has to be framed in the fact that we are seeing crisis upon crisis upon crisis. We've had an overdose crisis, we've had a homelessness crisis, we have the pandemic. And we have had a crisis of racism, of structural racism, longstanding. And so for certain individuals, we're living in the compounded conditions and states that are being imposed on them. Uh, and then we're asking questions about, you know, can, can people be healthy without housing? And, and for the reality of people on the ground, I mean, it's just, it's unconscionable uh, to be able to be where we're at. And I think when you look at the questions, you know, that have put forward, and I think to Christina's comments about, um, you know, the, the encampments or the city tents that have come up. And I know that it makes certain people, you know, look at it, feel uncomfortable, and, and they don't like the look of tents in our city. And, and to me, though, that that's just the push that we actually have to move on these solutions with all levels of government. And I think it's it speaks to the fact that we, you know, you ask about what can we do around uh, patient populations who've been discriminated. We have a provincial budget that's coming out with no mention of supportive housing when we have a homelessness crisis. So it's one thing that has to move. I think the province has to work with the feds and work with the city to see the rapid housing initiative, initiative become even more rapid and, and more mobile to get move more people into housing options. And I think we've seen today actually with some of the data that was presented at the science table for the province that uh, more income supports would be hugely helpful. Uh, paid sick leave is something again that we've seen a Very reversion. Much. Uh, a few years ago, and now we have people and asking them to stay home or get tested when we don't have paid sick leave in this province. Um, and again, I think on issues around ensuring that there is, is housing uh, that's available and supports, and it goes beyond just these temporary measures where we're then expected to have people go back to streets or shelters um, and say that, you know, we, we've done enough to make sure people are safe as vectors, but not as human beings and not delivering on housing as a human right. Yeah, as an opinion, I would say that I think a little discomfort is good for people, um, and I entirely agree. It's such it's such an enormous question, and sometimes I think it's interesting to try to just pick one slice and see if you could actually fix that one thing. And this actually ties into a question from the audience that I think can go to David. And effectively, they were asking for you know one example of say an intergenerational model of housing that you've seen have some success. And I'm guessing one of your projects probably has that in it. Yeah, we uh, we. In a lot of our family buildings, there are, you know, a significant number of elders in there as well, and the um, interaction with the elders and the children are the best example of where that would work well, because the children then are exposed to uh, traditional ideas and concepts, and uh, uh, just listening to an elder. And and if you you look at children, I have three grandchildren, and. Uh, 
you know, they they look at me, I know differently than their parents, for an example. And most of us who've reached my age realize that. So there's a lot of automatic respect and um, love that, that goes to an elder. And I think that there's also a common language between uh, elders and children, grandparents and grandchildren, that makes the learning process simpler and more valuable and more authentic. So with those situations where you have uh, families and, and, you know, grandparents, parents and children uh, in a community as well, what's really important uh, is, I mean, the bricks and mortar are there for security and for a place, but what is really valuable is the community. So if, if um, parents of some children are having a, a rough time of it uh, and some of that uh, is visited on the children, the children know they have friends, they have other um, parents in the community that they can go to because over a period of time, that what's, that's what happens, people mix and mingle. And so you get the advantage of community. Uh, hard to, hard to really uh, evaluate that. It it's like uh, the social return on investment that affordable housing brings. It's hard to put a number on it, but um, it is it is huge. Yeah, I don't think I don't you think can really can really put a dollar value on something like that. I would really like to see my grandmother right now. I would like to see my parents right now. I think all of us could benefit from a little intergenerational living right now. Yeah. and that kindness that 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 isolation is it, it's not good it's uh, you know i i just have a hard time with so many of the care homes where uh, you're not allowed to visit your parent or your elder uncle or that sort of thing it, it is not good for their health simple as that I mean, I, I guess we sort of strayed slightly into the idea of supportive services or talking again about the value of emotional and you know, medical, all of the supports needed to deal with this many decades long crisis um, when it comes to people's physical health and mental health. I wanted to take it back to, to Jan for a second. So when you were working with the Parkdale Neighborhood Land Trust, I mean, I know their structure is deeply built around the idea of deeply supportive housing or making sure that you know, those residents are part of a community. Is that something you try to apply broadly when you're looking at buying in or you know building new homes? I think the idea of, well, community is in our name, Ben City Community Investment Bank. Community is what we try to make sure the money is going towards as we look at how we finance things. Because I agree with David and with Andrew and with Christina, like without community, you know, things would be even worse. And with community, when you see communities rally, you see you know success economically, um, socially, and and generationally. So I think the idea of community and really tapping into community, I think, is something like you said. We're all missing it so much. Maybe we forgot how important it is. But as we as we recover, we need to make sure it's definitely a cornerstone of our recovery efforts. So. I hope so. Um and this conversation could go on a lot longer and I actually really wish that it could, um, but I guess we have to wrap up. And I just wanted to say thank you so much to our speakers for taking the time. Thank you to the Walrus for putting on this great event. Um, Christina's story for the Walrus titled Tiny Homes Won't Fix the Housing Crisis can be found at thewalrus.ca backslash living. And uh, with that, I'll hand it back to Jennifer. Thank you, everyone. Jayanne Gilfoy, David Eddy, Andrew Buzeri, and Christina D'Amico, as well, our moderator this evening, journalist Emily Mattu. Great to see you. And everyone in chat, thank you for your comments, your observations, and your questions. This is our final Walrus Talks of 2020 at home. But if you enjoy tonight's event, we will be back early in the new year. Keep an eye on your inbox. You will receive an email as a follow-up. And if you'd like to stay in touch and attend future events, that's the best way to do it. Sign up to our newsletter. The Walrus is a charity and our award-winning journalism, our events, and our podcasts are thanks to the support of our community of donors and supporters. So if you enjoyed tonight's free event, please consider making a donation. The address is thewalrus.ca slash donate. 
And if you make a gift before the end of this year, it will be matched dollar for dollar up to $100,000. And this is thanks to two generous Canadians, Diane Blake and Stephen Smith, who like you believe that healthy society is an informed one. Thank you also to Michelle Tremblay, everyone at CMHC, including Christelle Legault, uh, Catherine Fredericks for making this conversation possible. Thank you to our annual sponsors, Inspire, Labatt Breweries of Canada, Air Canada and Shaw. Community is really important in these COVID times and each one of you is part of the walrus. Thank you so much. Have a good evening.